First of all, I just want to say my own thanks to Nathan and to Petal for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure already. Um, I've already learned a ton, and I'm actually uh, curious to see how this argument I'm going to lay out for you, um, whether whether y'all buy it, whether uh, in fact it uh, can extend the parameters of structuralism to think about the material world in ways that um, uh, are amenable to, to to that sort of thinking, to, to um, that are um, uh, or not. Um, but it's very much a work in progress, and as you'll see, I, I only get to the literary example quite late in the piece. Um, so uh, I just want to say that I welcome uh, advice, thoughts about how to extend this argument, uh, and uh, of course I'm willing to defend it uh, as much as I can. But it's a new, it's a, uh, a new uh, line of thought. So I'm going to just uh, jump in. Um, when we consider what the practice of storytelling tells about humans and how we think, uh, we come rather quickly to the concept of fictionality. That we practice storytelling in our everyday lives and the things we look at or engage, in, engage with often tell a story if we dwell on them. Most accounts of storytelling privilege the hypothetical or suppositional nature of narrative. The story world differs from what is present and at hand in that it exists for the listener or reader as a mental event, rather than something materially instantiated in artifactual objects. In this sense, even if what we are narrating exists or existed somewhere, we are apt to consider questions of reference as a secondary matter. Not all stories are about real things or events, but all stories have their own internal rules that govern expectations about how they unfold and how all the parts of the structure interact with each other. This seductive view has a few nagging deficits. It reproduces familiar mind-body divisions, creating a fault line between what has physical reality outside of us and what has no extension and exists merely in the head. Like all Cartesian-inspired theories, it has a hard time explaining how we get from the ordinary material world that we muck around in from our earliest days as spitting infants to the logical space that we, of fiction that we traverse Gulliver-like once we've developed our rarefied linguistic and cognitive <laughs> capacities. Another problem is the seeming abstractness of this view. Why do we bother telling stories if they exist merely in the ether-like realm of fiction, remote from the sphere of practice that governs the everyday? The idea that, uh, uh, that stories are the product of a sustained act of mental abstraction has not always been thought of as an explanatory shortcoming or deficit. Structuralist poetics, which is the theory of recent decades most responsible for encouraging a view of narrative as an autonomous order, a poetic or aesthetic uh, space topologically distinct from referential reality, considered this supposed fact to be one of narrative's distinctive virtues. Methodologically, structuralists unshackled narrative from the slavish adherence to reality, to what is here and now. The result was to grant those who engage in the practice of storytelling special powers of imagination and, with it, a measure of mental or intellectual distance from what is familiar, conservative, and depressingly given. Structuralists and post-structuralists such as Roland Bauch and Friedrich Jameson um, argued about the relative power of realism as against genre fiction or avant-garde novels for procuring this freedom of mind. Um, the touchstone of the nouveau roman uh, and its glittery emptiness still carried a lot of weight. Um, and these debates inspired a voluminous amount of literary criticism in the 1980s and 90s, much of which was impl implicitly diagnostic. Critics thought that literature could be assessed for the degree to which it reproduced or departed from the political fantasies and ideological valences of the moment. Yet a version of the original problem remains. Suppose we grant storytellers their claim to mental autonomy. How do we translate that into real world efficacy? How do we move from descriptions or analytic reconstructions of the beliefs and values expressed by stories or their authors to accounts of how such expressions and commitments help change the world in some way? Or if we allow ourselves to move from the register of the heroic to the register of the mundane, 
how do we trace the relay of connections between thinking and acting that stories were invented to help us negotiate? Okay, I just want to say I'm making a lot of generalizations here. I'm simplifying all sorts of things. Um, sometimes I think it's important to, to, to start with a simple account, um, at least to know, um, to, to push in other directions. So um, we could talk about that uh, in a bit. Um, to address these questions and avoid the, the quandaries created by structuralism, I propose to pay less attention to the fictionality of stories, at least at the outset of the present inquiry, and more attention to how stories emerge developmentally from other kinds of practical engagement uh, with objects. Here I will draw on the ritually embodied picture of our cognitive systems that contemporary cognitive science has laid bare for us. Um, such science will help to clarify how we use stories in our everyday lives, whether we're speaking to a friend about what happened at the grocery store or writing and reading literary fiction. In both cases, storytelling allows us to think about action before it happens and to study uh, certain kinds of action that have already happened or could happen. How does it do this? Children's stories are especially good at revealing the basic form. Uh, take the opening lines, from Winnie the Pooh. These are, these, are, these are the lines. Here's Edward Bear coming downstairs now, bump, 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 on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin. It is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming down the stairs, but sometimes he feels that there really is another way, if only he could stop bumping for a moment and think about it. Um, Edward Bear, AKA Winnie the Pooh, shambles endearingly into action well before he has a chance to collect his thoughts or theorize them. Reading a passage such as this to a kid prompts the obvious question, is that the right way to go down the stairs? And if not, why not? Why go down the stairs in this way? Stories raise into view the normative structure of our everyday material interactions. We generate expectations whenever characters do things or objects present themselves, expectations about what happens next. Sometimes these predictions, which we experience both bodily and intellectually, elicit resulting responses from us. Cognitively and pragmatically, storytelling helps us to learn these expectations, follow the signs that elicit them, which means raising into view the norms and rules that govern them, and as well as investigating situations that defy our expectation. And here we could you know, bring up, say, Todorov's idea that stories involve disruption of what is expected or canonical in action or any of a number of other uh, like accounts. And so stories do those things. They also help us organize our reactions, not least our reactions to the specialized act of storytelling itself. As far as this last point goes, I want, to I want to underscore that storytelling is both an action or activity in and of itself, which we perform for various reasons. Uh, for example, to engage, entertain, or inform people. And it's also a specialized action that humans have devised to investigate action. Uh, the, the scrutiny that writers give to their interpretations of how people act may shift the way we understand and relate to action cognitively and emotionally. As storytelling becomes more artistically complex, storytellers begin to count among their tasks the act of investigating storytelling as a cultural activity. This practice reshapes how we see and engage with people and objects. By looking at the rules that define our interactions, storytelling can change or reorganize them. While cognitive scientists typically stress the mimetic power of stories, their ability to induct us into norms of action within our culture, the humanistic account that I intend to offer will also keep in focus the way stories play with norms, allowing us to adjust and restructure our material engagements in the process. Okay, so let me begin at the beginning. Um, most of us grant that stories like the worlds they describe are organized through norms, rules, and expectations, but we're much less aware of the materially embodied origin of these norms. Many, but by no means all of the interactions that allowed us to assimilate the norms took place long ago, and now our cognizing happens at lightning quick unconscious speed. 
Moreover, we tend to get lost in the symbolic dimensions of storytelling, the complex, self-referring structure of signs on which the, the story system is built, which structuralists were particularly keen on investigating. On the surface, these signs and the rules that structure them seem relatively closed, that is, uh, dependent on each other, arbitrary and conventional, not contingent on the specific facts of the world and our embodied relationship to it. However, recent neuroscientific evidence suggests otherwise, that the system of multidimensional signs on which stories um, uh, are built, um, in the words of N. J. Enfield, quote, draw from the body, from extensions of the body, and from the physical and artifactual surroundings, unquote. To underscore this, I will eventually be examining Hemingway's short story, The Big Two-Hearted River, which is about a man on a fishing trip, and which considers in detail how the meditative activity of fishing anchors and nests the protagonist's cognitive activity in the world of things around him. Modernist writers such as Hemingway, Virginia Woolf, and Henry James, who were particularly sympathetic to a view of the mind as outwardly directed, sought out inventive narrative styles to probe our material engagements, the one we rely on for interpretive inquiry. They did this, in part, to restore the architecture of our thinking to the material structures from which they came, and thus to heal us of our tendencies to get lost in our own convoluted abstractions. In recent years, cognitive scientists and neuroscientists have begun their own investigations into the embodied basis of such things as concept formation and folk psychological reasoning, which is the way we attribute things like beliefs, desires, and intentions to people. A cluster of theories has emerged, referred to variously as embodied, embedded, extended, or inactive cognition, the four E's in which I would also lump distributed cognition and several other things. Um, uh, these uh, forms of cogn these modes of cognition or models of cognition which refuse to make a strong distinction between thinking, feeling, and acting. Um, and these um, developments cast new light on the embodied and environmental dimensions of all thinking and cognizing. So a little background is that I've begun a book project on extended cognition and other post-cognitivist models of mind, um, in part because I want to think about how um, this particular embodied branch of cognitive science can be recruited um, to think about humanistic uh, stuff uh, because uh, its view of the mind as stretching out into the world uh, is uh, uh, much closer to the way humanists think about minds. That is, uh, uh, deeply ensconced um, in the cultural uh, environments in which we think. So um, I think that these models of mind could bring culture back in, they bring the body back in in, all, in very interesting ways, um, and um, they, they, they have a potential um, for re-socializing neuroscience, for bringing um, culture back in, uh, into cultural context back into neuroscience in a way that's amenable to our now several decades old project of re-socializing the humanities. Um, their experimentally based theories um, help, I think, in the argument I want to make, uh, help us understand how we cognitively encounter texts understood in a practice-based context. Okay, so that's the, the, uh, where I'm, I'm trying to head in the larger project, and I can tell talk to you more about that uh, if you're interested. But um, so, so I, I want to argue that the four E's help us understand storytelling as a mental activity and as a social and material practice. Um, and it's this hybrid thought object that I'll be theorizing uh, today. I pro uh, propose the claim that storytelling is one of the main cultural practices we employ to investigate action, but I want to be clear that I'm not articulating anything so grandiose as a full ontology of narrative thinking. I'm not even sure that such an ontology is possible, given the constructiveness and fund fundamental heterogeneity of different practices and arts of storytelling. 
Instead of a single cognitive feature, we might search out a family resemblance among characteristics as they manifest in different examples within the category. Even this would require us to consider such disparate things as the pleasure of storytelling, the capacity to deliver and test information and knowledge, and the appearance of story elements such as characters, which show how we model personhood in literature. And these are all topics that come in and out of focus in, in, the, in the book project. The more restricted subject for today is how some forms of narrative uh, literature model action and why it might be helpful to see those models as dependent on our homely engagements with the world rather than operations inside the head. There are two parts to my argument. The first part considers the place of stories in our cognitive development, how we learned our proficiency with reading and interpreting action, uh, and what place our embodiment, as opposed to abstract concepts, plays in our interpretation. And the second part has to do with, um, with stories, particularly literary narratives, what they do for us as readers of them now, what social, material, and phenomenological effects they have on us. And again, this means that my um, uh, my literary reading will be um, woefully delayed, so just be patient. Um, and I also want to, um, I welcome, I open, I, I uh, solicit suggestions for examples that might help me flesh out my argument. Um, embodied cognition encourages us to see novels less as action-neutral epistemic pictures and more as pragmatic devices for investigating, planning, and changing up the way we do things, both in the cognitive environment of the fiction itself and outside of it in the world. It's this pragmatic, active, and interactive dimension of storytelling that I want to tease out. I start with the first issue. We do not normally think of novels as requiring tacit embodied awareness, or if we do, we assume that such embodied awareness was replaced or retrofitted long ago by concepts. To a considerable extent, we can blame this view on structuralism. Structuralists presume that, the me that meaning depends on the synchronic organization of a discursive system, um, that it's reproduced through social contact with the system, not on any preconceptual relationship embodied or otherwise with the world. Jacques Lacan makes this explicit in his idea that, that the symbolic forecloses on the real, but the idea goes back to the theoretical roots of structuralism. The two-part sign structure that its main architect, the linguist Ferdinand de Saussure, formulated to analyze language as a rule-based order made it very hard to consider how signs are constituted in the thing world in which they are embedded. As Saussure puts it, the linguistic sign, this is a quote from him, the linguistic sign unites not a thing and a name, but a concept and a sound image, unquote. According to Chris Sinha, he thereby relegated the world of things to a place outside meaning and meaning making. Things not only do not signify, but they're not even in any direct way signified. Semiotic value exists only in the realm of signs. Semantic substance is immaterial and conceptual. The material world, in short, does not have meaning, it is merely an asemiotic or pre-semiotic condition for meaning. The abstracting of the system of signs from the world of objects and activities in which they are embedded prevented Saussure from tracing their origin back to our embodied interaction with things. Currently, many philosophers, psychologists, and cognitive scientists aim for a broader and more materially engaged form of semiology, one that is attentive to the way that our thinking and talking depend on the physical nature of the objects uh, and, and the pragmatic relationships we have with them. For example, when young children interact with hollow blocks in construction tasks, they learn to recognize those blocks as objects, such as a container, cup, or chair, depending on their size and use. And this in turn shapes the way they think about concepts such as in or on with respect to such objects. Children may, for example, fail to recognize an upside down cup because the specificity of its use is not obvious given its spatial orientation. For their part, structuralists paid little attention to these ways we acquire and transmit norms through patterns of use or engagement. Or actually, it's not quite uh, accurate to say that structuralist theory paid no attention to objects and material interactions. Take, for example, the structuralist identified psychologist Jean Piaget, 
or like whether he's structuralist or not is a, is a, a big qu question, but he wrote a book on it with that title. So um, he's famous for examining how young infants develop the concept of object permanence, uh, which he deemed foundational for their attainment of symbolic thought. He designated experiments to test at what stage infants learn that objects continue to exist even when they cannot see them. He surmised that, uh, that they develop rules, they call them mental schemas, which they acquire by abstracting from the specific objects in question. Thus, for Piaget, the logic of object permanence is a kind of abstract mental syntax, uh, one that importantly gives no special attention to the particular structure of the objects concerned. Just as with Saussure, objects lack semiotic and functional value. Any object, a cup, doll, ball, or brick, being substitutable for any other object. Piaget's original experiment involved placing a, do a, a toy behind a lid in direct view of an infant um, who develops the habit of reaching for it on several occasions. Subsequently, the experimenter switches the toy's location to a second spot, also in direct view of the infant. After a short delay, children between eight and 10 months old look for the toy in the original spot, not where the toy disappears the second time. This error, which uh, children older than 12 months old do not commit, suggested to Piaget that the concept of object permanence is acquired at a stage moment of development, and this concept overwrites embodied knowledge of the object's presence, learned um, merely through reaching behaviors by substituting an abstract conceptual awareness. Um, research, uh, researchers allied with embodied cognition, uh, such as Esther Thelen and her group, um, designated experiments whose results profoundly reinterpret Piaget's conclusions. They surmise that the formation of a concept such as object permanence never really loses its embodied character. By their account, infants who recognize that an object has changed location do so not by acquiring a universal concept, but by learning to break their habits with one kind of reaching behavior in favor of another more successful behavior. The experiments show that the environment shapes and constrains their interactions in ways that regulate their behavior. Learning is a process of interacting with the environment in new ways. This also means that specific changes to the environment can change or eliminate the children's error, even much earlier than Piaget thought. Another important consequence is that uh, the reaching behaviors are themselves normatively constructed. Children learn that cups are upright containers and blocks can be altered to be containers or stacked objects depending on their social use. Norms exist within embodied arrangements, not independently of them. Okay, by this point, I think you're all wondering why you're, whether you're in some other disciplinary formation than in a, in a kind of humanistic um, setting. It might be obscure what such embodied accounts of cog uh, concept formation have to do with storytelling. Stories are a product of language, which depends on a complicated system of formal relations among signs that are conventional in character and quite remote from these embodied mechanisms. Uh, while that's certainly true, I point out that such language is nested in socially shared material signs, which are developmentally the way we first learn to engage with objects and things, verbally and otherwise. Instead of starting from the premise that stories are fictional worlds with their own internal logic, we might instead consider them as a kind of materially engaged action or activity, one that we can approach by analogy to another common behavior, the way children play with each other. Pretend play has a similar logic to storytelling. It's a form of mental rehearsal that investigates action. I was sitting on a beach um, campsite in Nova Scotia, um, not unlike the beach here, uh, watching two kids scuttling around the rocks of the seawall, playing at being wife and husband, making their dinner together. Children engage in this bizarre pastime in part to review and study the normative character of a variety of social interactions. Other classical versions of this game, which I remember from my own morbid fascinations as a kid, include being a doctor or patient, or being a group leader or follower. Indeed, a number of cognitive scientists, in including Carol Feldman and Sinha, 
uh, trace the complicated operations of storytelling back to the cultural rehearsals involved in pretend play. Play often relies on hybrid objects, part physical, part mental objects to enable the activity, such as using a rock for a stove or using a stick as a gun. In many narrative situations, including theater, actors still use props as hybrid objects to advance the story. And we can look to these semiotic artifacts for evidence of the materially embedded nature of storytelling practices. These props help to anchor the social interaction by structuring the sequence of words and gestures that meaningfully make up the activity. They provide a center of focus for joint attention, which serves to organize the cognitive interpretive response, as well as the regimes of value, that is, the things we care enough to pay attention to. And they blend symbolic spaces in ways that I'll discuss in a moment. If fictional stories are like pretend play, it's not because both activities cordon off the material and embodied world for purely hypothetical spaces. The concept of fiction is so entrenched in our thinking that cognitive scientists of a more classical bent habitually treat pretend play as a form of fiction. Radu Bogdan is typical here regarding pretend play as a meta-representation that, quote, quarantines the play in its own perceptual motor envelope, unquote. Um, however, we should note that both activities, both fiction and play, do not separate worlds so much as combine them. They make cognitive use of familiar action routines to investigate new embodied systems of action. For example, children who pretend that a stick is a gun need to know how uh, to hold stick-like objects, how to recognize objects as tools, as well as how to point them and understand the norms and expectations that pertain to their uses. Mark Turner and Gilles uh, uh, Fauconnier um, have developed a theory called cognitive blending to conceptualize how norms and rules from separate cognitive domains blend elements from both systems. From them, these blends create a new emergent cognitive space that is different from what they call the input space. My example, uh, the, the space associated with sticks and the target space, gunslinging culture in this emergent space um, amped up you know, three foot high um, kids with hemming down Snoopy shirts of, you know, shooting each other. Um, this analogy between play and storytelling is instructive for several reasons. It casts storytelling as essentially an interactive activity. In this activity, the participants um, learn things about the world by blending or combining a new set of rules into old patterns. To accomplish this, children have to negotiate rules of play, um, you be Chuck Norris, I'm the Terminator. No, but, Chuck no but um, the Terminator doesn't walk like that, and so on. Um, so similarly, writers and readers need to follow more or less formalized rules of the game to participate in storytelling. Note first that the prevailing rules and norms of each activity are learned as much from participating in the games as from having them explained. There's an inactive component here. People gain knowledge of the system tacitly as well as explicitly as they become observers and then participants. They begin to interact in ways that give them feedback as to whether they're playing appropriately. Literary genres are in effect tacit rules within, a story, within storytelling that spell out how readers and writers are supposed to anticipate patterns and structure, uh, that structure their cognitive interactions. Uh, and they follow a similar logic to exploratory play. While novelists are able to dispense with the physical objects that serve as props, this does not mean that the mental world they project is fundamentally disembodied. They merely learn to use linguistic signs as proxies or substitutes for the semiotic artifacts that once helped to, to regulate their interactions. Indeed, writers are so successful at finding verbal equivalents for the material features they're describing that they appear to create what some would call a virtual world, a mindscape full of mental furniture, as well as Harry Potter's and Emma Bovary's projected in the inner theater of the brain. Of course, this view ignores the mediated physical support of books that propagate the symbol systems through which writers project such motley mental story worlds. Uh, it also ignores the, social, uh, the socially collaborative element of storytelling, which is stretched between writer and reader over such a prolonged period that the activity's interactiveness moves out of view. 
However, putting these issues to the side, those who regard literary narratives as an autonomous world, a universe of discourse unto themselves, are right in this respect. The very length and complexity of, of the narratives give prominence to the story's symbolic features, which appear to matter more for their internal relationships than their direct uh, association with physical and embodied processes. This is what structuralists call the symbolic order, a space defined principally by the coded system itself. Here we come back to the logic of treating stories as fictions, whatever their referential claim. In some ways, story systems do obey their own emergent logic, where the concept of emergence suggests a self-organizing system in which, to quote Andy Clark, the explanatory burden increasingly falls not on the parts, but on their organization. While Clark's preferred met examples are things like slime molds and convection rolls, physical systems that make the phenomenon of emergence less mysterious, the cognitive anthropologist Terence Deacon usefully applies the concept of emergence to human symbol systems whose particular configurations of constraints on possibility result in unprecedented properties at a higher level." Unquote. As Eduardo Kahn points out, crucially for Deacon, something that is emergent is never cut off from that from which it came and within which it is nested because it is still dependent on these more basic levels for its properties. Taking Kahn's caveat to heart, I would argue that critics exaggerate the claim to semiotic autonomy that they make for stories. As we have seen, symbol systems depend in a variety of ways on our embodiment. Where then in stories do we get a handle on such embodiment? And what does uh, that knowledge tell us about the uh, symbolic story world that emerges from it? If narrative literature models action, uh, what are stories capable of teaching us about the dependence of our thinking on action? Hmm. So to glean some answers to these questions, I'm going to choose an extremely counterintuitive example, as is my want, probably to my downfall, it makes my life terribly hard. Um, easier examples would be things like theater, where we use props to structure interaction, especially epic theater, which breaks the fourth wall and makes interactiveness um, with the audience explicit and political. Narratives that consider the revolving door of representation might also be interesting examples. Um, Alex. Uh, um, mentioned to me yesterday, um, uh, the Indonesian documentary, The Art of Killing, where Indonesian death squad leaders reenact their mass, um, their mass killings in whichever cinematic genres come to their creepy minds, um, Hollywood crime dramas and musicals, it turns out. Um, so in those examples, epic theater and um, the art of killing, the symbolic imagination is, oh, no, I mean, in the art of killing, the symbolic imagination is anchored to the very real history of torture and murder that these people actually um, create, they committed. But those examples will likely push us to talk about the symbolic dimensions of fiction and how it motivates and restructures reality to terrifying effect. So I'm going to pick a narrative that is not superficially interactive, but which, despite its orthodox literary style, puts a premium on much more elementary embodied processes. Hemingway's short story, The Big Two-Hearted River. Do people know this short story? No? OK. Um, you don't need to know much about it. I'll, I'll say the few things. I could, I could talk more about it. I would have loved to actually spend time close reading passages since they are stunning um, in various ways. But um, uh, if, if you're interested or, um, uh, or whatever, we could talk about it in the Q&A. Um, one reason I propose this story as a model is that Hemingway aims to keep in view the way symbolic thought is anchored or nested in our uh, most elemental embodied relations to objects. In many ways, his stylistic project is to draw out the embodied feeling that underlies our thinking and acting, and thus to reveal what affect can do to anchor, shape, and alter the values that underwrite our thoughts and, action, and actions. Ironically, nothing much happens in a big two-hearted river. Um, um, at least by the conventional standards of narrative fiction. A man goes fishing by himself. 
that Hemingway chooses to narrate the observations and activities of his protagonist, Nick, tells us less about the normative structure of plots than it does about the small spatial stories that embed us in the world. In the literary mind, an influential account of the cognitive origins of storytelling from the mid-1990s, Mark Turner uses the idea of a small spatial story to pinpoint how our embodied experience gives shape or narrative meaning to the most basic acts of observation and explanation in an environment. Hemingway would seem to align the genre demands of the short story, which definitionally must be short, with Turner's minimalist investigation into the basic constituents of storytelling in order to re, uh, refine our sense of how stories allow us to extract new meaning from our previously acquired embodied knowledge of the world. So let me turn to um, Hemingway to, to flesh, flesh this out. Uh, the Big Two-Hearted River begins with these lines. Quote, the train went on up the track out of sight around one of the hills of burnt timber. Nick sat down on the bundle of canvas bed, uh, and bedding the baggage man had pitched out of the door of the baggage car." Unquote. These sentences, and frankly, most of the sentences that follow them, offer examples of small spatial stories. Turner would call uh, them events in space. Such events present a template for the basic constituents of storytelling. They're patterns of structure we use to make sense of new environments and actions. For Turner, narrative is central to our thinking because stories serve as a repository for this, new, uh, for this embodied knowledge. Like the wind blowing clouds through the sky or a child throwing a rock, they rely on what cognitive scientists such as Mark Johnson call image schemas to organize objects and how we engage with them. Image schemas are skeletal patterns that recur in our sensory and motor experiences, motion along a path, and, and bounded interior are typical image schemas, uh, as are animacy and agency. Um, the train Hemingway describes went on up the track, which involves a path schema, a thing that has a beginning and an end, as well as a spatial orientation, went on up. Nick's baggage thr uh, thrown or pitched off the, the train offers a subset of image schemas of force dynamics, such as pushing, pulling, resisting, climbing, pouring, and falling. There's also the execution schema and the, anima sch uh, the animacy schema at work. The train and the baggage man are causes in themselves, executing a movement originating in them as entities. When we project an image schema on an action, object, or event, we express among the most basic cognitive skills uh, that are performed in storytelling by anchoring these things in familiar patterns of embodied engagement. They're dynamic interactions that we code in our brains as neurocognitive patterns, and psychologists think they are at the origin of our concept formation. Such projection is the main way we extract meaning from stories, as, as Turner sees it. Small spatial stories help us navigate new situations by projecting old stories into new contexts. He calls this act of projecting story patterns on each other parable, which is not the extravagant genre of moral emblems or allegories, but the ordinary act of taking something in terms of something else. The idea of parable is very close to the concept of cognitive blending and in fact borrows from it. So for example, the path schema in the first sentence of Hemingway's story is perhaps most interpretively interesting because it sets up the logic of parable. Like the train that, delivered, that has delivered the protagonist to, to this spot, Nick is on both a literal journey and a mental or emotional journey modeled on the sensory motor structure of the path schema. Okay. Before you cringe at the triteness of the image, or of my interpretation, uh, which depends on fast unconscious connections, I want to call attention to my, lar uh, my larger observation that the story is almost entirely composed of events in space and other concrete image schemas, as if Hemingway were merely prolonging the exposition of plot till it becomes the whole story. The cumulative power of these image schemas is to reinforce the preferred event shape to which Hemingway's descriptions gravitate. Mostly punctual actions or bounded activities, they say something about the form of valuing that the story stresses as important. 
Memorable examples from the story include the moment that Nick snarls his first fish, snares his first fish, or when he opens a can of apricots and the narrator tells us that he liked to open cans. In a narrative in which uh, nothing much happens, these, move, uh, these moments jump out. By implicitly negating more dramatic plot structures, the story also dampens norms that govern our expectations of the kinds of, uh, kinds of events we choose to narrate, potentially reordering the implied system of values associated with those norms. Hemingway's narrative, like Turner's account of small spatial stories, remains wonderfully concrete and moored within pragmatic experience. Even so, Hemingway and Turner have their differences. Turner leaves the larger symbolic systems that structure narrative fiction mostly out of view. That is, the very clarity and groundedness of his understanding of storytelling ignores the ever-present danger. And here, I think after this conference, I would say also the possibilities of symbolic thought. That story, uh, but the danger is that, symbolic, um, that, st that our stories merely project other stories in a circular conversation with each other. By contrast, Hemingway is exceedingly aware of the social symbolic fictions that, of, that underwrite so many of our storytelling practices, from his renowned dislike of the rhetorical abstractions that inspire war to his meticulous linguistic and descriptive exactitude. He emphasizes the pull of the tangible, anchored, shareable world over the flourishes of bookish self-reference. Comparable in some ways um, to Ian McEwan, I guess also badly in, pol in political terms, but, um, but um, uh, in Jane Thrailkill's account, um, McEwan eschews grand social and ideological narratives in favor of the small and the everyday. And in this way, like Hemingway, uh, the two of them seem to seek out reparatory values of everyday stories whose concreteness and embedding in action direct the mind's focus back to the referential world, restructuring a cognitive orientation in the process. The activity of fishing is also relevant here, both as an expression of mindfulness or mindedness and as a refuge against the anxiety-inducing complexity of the post-war climate and its defunct grand narratives. This is made clear in novels such as The Sun Also Rises, which also has a, uh, an extended fishing trip as interlude set against the backdrop of its main character's post-war anomie in the 1920s. Escape from the symbolic swamp of stagnant thoughts and circular reasoning, the fishing trip becomes a, re a reinvigorating opportunity for mental focus and reattachment to the object world. I think this explains why Hemingway ends the novel with, or not, excuse me, with, ends the story, The Big Two-Hearted River, uh, with the postponement of Nick's plan to fish the swamp. As we are told earlier, the fishing would be tragic. The emergence here of an activity that threatens to frustrate simple direct action with a space that is cut off and secluded from movement is conflated with a higher order literary symbolic space of tragedy. The implication is that as embodied actions such as fishing get tangled, so does thinking. Lacking necessary outlet in action, such thinking gets trapped in a swampy system of signs or genre codes that close in on themselves. To be clear here, I'm not suggesting that Hemingway finds in the embodied world, rooted in referential experience, a state prior to or independent of symbolic thought. I have no intention of opening up Hemingway to the dreaded post-structuralist indictment that he nostalgically gravitates toward a dream of unmediated presence. Hemingway does say of Nick such things as, he felt he had left everything behind, the need of thinking, the need to write, other needs. It was all back of him. But in fact, Nick is constantly thinking um, in a very particular kind of way through an ecological awareness or attunement that puts human symbolic thought back into the flow of interaction with simpler material signs. And just to uh, um, uh, uh, be, just to like set this up a little bit for kind of the Q&A, the way I imagine this is um, something like, like um, by uh, reference to Charles Sanders Peirce's um, models of semiotics where 
icons and indexes are like earlier forms of signs that are uh, um, uh, like uh, on which the more complicated forms of human symbolic thought are, are propped. Um, so, um, uh, so that we see all of the levels of interaction actually working with each other in which like the kinds of interactions that structuralists wanted to talk about are at the kind of higher order level, but I want to like think about these like earlier, simpler forms of science. Um, and if I had time, I'd, I'd, um, I'd spend time thinking about some like gorgeous descriptions of trout moving upstream and kingfishers losing and then finding their shadows as moments where I iconic and indexical thinking is at work in the, in the story. Um, in the Big Two-Hearted River, the fabric of human and non-human things in, in the environment both begin to speak in ways that make their direct, iconic, and index indexical relations more visible and more understandable in embodied terms. To reinstitute embodiment and reference to the semiotic world is to double down on the mediated and materially grounded nature of signs themselves. It also has the potential to shift and redefine how we understand the work of fictionality in storytelling so that we can appreciate better how story fictions maintain connections uh, with the action context of our mental life. Am I simply arriving at the banal conclusion that the referential uh, building blocks of narrative are always propped on the rudiments of the material world? Yes, but that's not all there is to it. I argued before that we have to understand fictional storytelling by analogy to play behavior. Storytelling is not only a cognitive tool that we develop to investigate action, it is also a specialized action or activity in its own right. It is a structured game between writer and reader that aligns their actions to a system of rules which, like the stick as gun game, enables them to recruit previously embodied experiences to make sense of new actions. When Hemingway gives us a narrative without much of a plot, he's switching up the conventional rules of the game. That is, he's using the activity of storytelling which structures interactions between writer and reader on a second order level to reorganize the actions or activity that the narrative is trying to understand on the primary story level of discourse. By impeding or inhibiting conventional rules of plotting with its various protocols of hierarchy and saliency, his story alters our patterns of emotional response. Remember the unusual event patterns that Hemingway uses to structure these emotional responses, what I called before the preferred event shapes uh, of the story. He has unconventional ways of structuring reader uh, and writers joint attention, bringing their separate forms of attention into alignment or friction with one another. And as Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein once observed about game rules, quote, in one case, we make a move in an existent game. In the other, we establish a rule of the game. Moving a piece could be conceived in these two ways, as a paradigm for future moves or as a move in an actual game. So in one case, we're following rules given to us. In the other case, we're making up a new rule from within the procedures of the game. From this inactivist point of view, fiction is a kind of game that we learn by interacting with organized activities or auto-poetic properties of the system. This inactivist model redefines fictionality in interesting ways. By this, and here I'm just wrapping up. Um, by this account, the practice of telling fictions is not a means of creating vivid pictures in the head. That is, it's not a form of symbolic representation that we internalize subject to various degrees of accuracy. It's not an as-if world. Instead, we might think of novels as games that set us up to interact with the textual narrative to enable particular kinds of responsiveness, both to the narrative game and to the semiotic environments given token representation in the story world. By this inactive view of storytelling, novels do not simply rehearse our culture's prevailing norms of interaction. Instead, artistic play opens up the possibility of cre creating novel forms of collaboration and response. That's it. Thank you.